very Thomas, much, Carlos. Yes. Hello. Well, I am actually from Venezuela. I've been based in Barcelona in the last seven years or eight years. I'm an urbanist. And during these last seven years I've been in Barcelona, I've been mostly working, making the Fab Lab Barcelona to exist within the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia. And it's kind of interesting because I've managed to find a space in which I can relate both of the things that I've been working in more than half of my life, which is cities and technology, in this case, fabrications. No? So I'm very interested in how technology has shaped uh, humanity and how humanity is shaping technology. So it's kind of an infinite loop, if you think about it. And if you look back in history, um, maybe too far away, but and I'm skipping another big chunk of uh, human history, but if we start in 15th century, um, I, I really like this moment in which um, we, find out, like, we found out that there were some more people in the other side of the ocean. Well, actually, I was part of that people as well, so I'm, I'm conqueror and, con and conqueror. So the thing is that by that time, during the same fifth, uh, fifth, uh, 15th century, um, it's almost the same that if today we are looking at the moon and someone you know, says, hi, we are here. No? So the whole perspective of uh, the, the, let's say the, the, our presence in the planet uh, dramatically changed. No? And, but in the same 15th century, Gutenberg invented the printing press. And it's not a casualty that the discovery of, of the New World and all the expansion of the Western civilization in the New World happened so fast. So Gutenberg is kind of, um, the invention of Gutenberg could be compared to the internet today. But the thing is that at the same time, that was the, basically the, the foundations for uh, the medieval age to finish and starts the Renaissance. No? More information traveling everywhere, people exchanging knowledge, learning. There is, if you wanted to have access to a book or a publication, you don't have to wait to someone to write it, but you can reproduce it thanks to the printing press. And that basically created the foundations of what we call the Renaissance, a very important moment in the history of humanity and then advances, advantage, um, advances of technology. And, and if you think furthermore, that was the foundations of the first industrial revolution with the, you know, the invention of a a steam machine, um, late, late 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century, and how the machine starts to replace the work of a man, right? And if you continue going and going, this is the foundations again of the introduction of the production line, Henry Ford introducing the 4T, mass uh, production, as Cecilia was talking before, and basically it's the foundations of the world as we, as we, as we know it today, you know? Um, that's the beginning of the 20th century, but during that exact same time, that it's very interesting to find out that the biggest advantage, the latest advantage of technology have happened within the military industry. So the First and Second World War basically promoted or kind of pushed forward the invention of things uh, like computers, which you are taking pictures with or you are tweeting and checking your emails and not paying attention to this presentation. But basically, you know, guys like Alan Turing were actually intercepting the Nazi messages, and that was basically the invention of a, a computation, which is really fascinating. No? So once the First and Second World War are uh, finished, then there's, oh, what we do with all this knowledge? So basically it goes to the companies, and then the rest is history. No? Companies like DuPont, 3M, and so on were created within the military industry. So. Another very interesting moment is in when those computers start stop to occupy like a 40 square or 60 square meter room and then are part of our desktop and they become usable no? and that some of that things happening of thanks to the advances uh, uh, um, advances in the in the transistors the transistor technology but also because some people thought about okay what why if you, we make these things usable for anyone no? so that's why you know most of the people put Steve Jobs as one of the fathers of, uh, let's say, personal computation. But of course, it goes together with the advances of technologies. And then, another very important point is um, the invention of the internet and how we move from that our internally created uh, network of communications in case of Russian attack in the, during the Cold War became basically our main communication stream today. So I'm going to go really fast now because I don't have much time, but basically we invented personal computers, the internet, 
um, but we're still relying on a very old model in which we extract the raw materials in one side of the world, we send it to the other, we produce things, we send it to the other part of the world, we consume them, we produce trash, and that trash goes somewhere else. Goes somewhere else. And basically creates like a standard, you know, um, kind of repetition of brands, things, and how we dress, and how, what we use, you can buy any, all of these brands in mostly every corner in the world today, which is really boring. So the thing is that, this is a model that you can call PITO. Basically, PITO is a very bad word in Spanish, but it means product in, trash out. It means that everything that the city needs to operate is being imported from thousands of miles away, and whatever it produces is trash that is not used. And then the, the really shift here is basically to move towards a model in which, yes, computers are great, internet is amazing, but then how we can make distributed fabrication or production to happen. So this is called DIDO which is called data in, data out. It means how you can create a closed cycle of the matter within the city limits, and then whatever comes in and out is knowledge and bits of, inf of information. No? So if you think about it, some people compare the invention of the printing press with the invention of the 3D printers. This is one of very old 3D printers from EOS, um, a technology that was invented in the 80s, basically. But I'm going to say what is called with 3D printing, because basically the first machine invented at MIT was using uh, paper printing, cut rushes, deposit depositing materials into some other materials to make it structures. Um, so we started to create this image of how I print something, a paper in my desktop, I can print a thing at the same time, and so on. Now these are the, the different technologies, and basically what we, what is really called 3D printing is everywhere today is basically this thing that is, is kind of a, you know, like a cake machine, it's like a, your grandmother when they, they were making the cakes, but now controlled by a computer, no? So, um, and yeah, you can use different materials. Some people are printing with chocolate and stuff. So it starts to create like a kind of relationship between digital and physical world, which is quite interesting and more fluid. I, it's great. And then also uh, there is a disruption moment in, 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 the, in the advances of 3D printers is when they become really accessible, no? It's how they go from $30,000 machines to uh, a few hundreds, and Red Rab and Adrian Boyer and Big Oliver did that in Bath University 10 years ago. So the thing is that I, I liked really much this quote from, from Neil Gershenfeld. So the 3D printer bomb, uh, boom is kind of compared with what the microwave oven had in the 50s. People thought that it was going to replace the kitchen, but it didn't happen. Actually, if you want to cook something, let's say some kind of sophisticated and, and you know, valuable, you need the rest of equipment. You need an oven and you maybe need some other tools. No? So that's where it comes Fab Labs. Imagine if one machine can change the world, and that's what we say about 3D printers. Imagine a set of machines and people together, not people isolated in their, in their rooms printing, but actually in the same place, creating and sharing and uh, innovating. No? So Fab Labs, uh, what you cannot create in a 3D printer is things like a skateboard or a or, a, or an entire house. For sure, you cannot make it that in your living room, no? So the thing is accessibility at the same time is not for masters, PhD degrees. People, it's actually people from an eight year old. They learn how to make and program their own circuit boards when they, um, instead of going to karate, let's say. So this is a network connected uh, through internet. This is one class of FAB Academy. This is basically an online course in which people learn how to, from how to design a circuit board of how to make their own furniture. This is the existing amount of Fab Labs. It's around 250 connected uh, in an open network. And then within that, we are creating the third industrial revolution, if you want to call it like that. Um, OK, then I'm going to be very fast. In one minute, I'm going to tell you the story of Fab Lab Barcelona now. So Fab Lab Barcelona, created in 2007. It's the first Fab Lab in Europe. We started the Fab Academy with the Center for Vietnam Atoms at MIT. We are creating a Spanish network of, of Fab Labs. Uh, we are coordinating the international network of Fab Labs um, together with the Fab Foundation, and we are organizing the Fab Conference this July from the 2nd to the 8th, which we expect you to come. It's actually, if you walk a few minutes from here, it's next to the Magic Fountain. And it's going to gather the international community of Fab Labs for one week. Within the Fab Lab Barcelona, we have created projects like Smart Citizen through crowdfunding campaigns and now becoming a company. Um, I'm not going to go into details. We have made uh, an entire Fab Lab, an entire house made in a Fab Lab. You can download it in our wiki site. If you find other 30 people that want to make it with you. Uh, we are opening the Green Fab Lab in the Colcerola Park in Barcelona, where we're going to do research in the next generation of Fab Labs and its relation with nature. Um, and then we are promoting the Fab City project with the City Council of Barcelona and the MIT and the Fab Foundation. 
launched by Tony Vives, the deputy mayor in Lima in 2011. I'm going to finish, I promise. Uh, this is based on the next, let's say, the vision of the Barcelona on the, of the future. This includes a network of fab labs connected and sharing and bringing back productivity into the city and tools for people to innovate. These are some of the fab labs that are still are already being created by the city council. Um, so just to finish, yes, if, if Obama talked about 3D printing, it's time to move to the next step if we want to be innovative. And it's already people talking about what is the, ne what is the next step, 4D printing or 5D printing, so we, won't, we don't know. So I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs>